Director's public hearing for the plan specifications and form of contract for bid 17-017, Rue Elementary East Side Playground. Let the record show that all board members except uh, Dr. Agress are present for the hearing. Uh, the superintendent and district administration are recommending approval of the plans, specifications, and form of contract for bid 17-017, Rue Elementary East Side Playground. Um, I would ask Dr. Bruckner or designee to quickly review the recommendation. Uh, following review, board members will have a chance to ask questions. When we have completed with our questions, we will also have an opportunity for anyone in the audience to ask questions. And the official board action on those plans and specifications will take place later in the meeting. So, thank you. Yeah. Stacy Pettit is going to review information about this bid for Rue Elementary East Side Playground. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? All right. Uh, this evening, I want to talk to you about the Rue Eastside Playground Project bid 17-017. And basically, this is like the final phase of playground equipment over at Rue Elementary. And just to kind of give you a quick background, in 2009-10 time frame, we actually, Rue went under some renovations, but it was made, made mainly interior renovations. They didn't do a lot on the outside of the building. So um, basically, this kind of brings the playground up to code and cleans up the outdoor spaces in those areas. And as you can see on this plan, the red area is where this is existing equipment is today. It sits over our geothermal well field, which is not ideal if we're adding equipment. And we kind of would like to reimagine the playground in a different area, which is the blue area up above. We can bring it up to ADA code, kind of get it all in a more compact area. And then it also provides a bigger green space for our students when they're at PE, doing PE, football, soccer, whatever they want to do on the outside. Um, currently, we have some equipment that's on the side of the building. We have some swing sets, um, a nice tornado slide that are actually in pretty good condition and we want to reuse those in the new playground area. And also in these photos you can kind of see pea gravels kind of falling all off the side here. It's a little bit of a mess to clean up on a daily basis for our custodians. So the new playground will kind of hold all that pea gravel back a little bit better than what this current one does. Um, this is the new designed area, and as you can see from the um, photo to the left, at the top we have the new swing set area. We'll add some Brazilian surfacing so we can put an ADA swing in that area. And then on the lower part of that, you can see the hatched area in blue will be an ADA transition point for wheelchair access to the bigger playground area where you can transfer onto the transfer point, climb up, and get on the smaller slide and slide down. Our PTO over at RU has been diligently working for the last year to fundraise to add to this playground as well. So we're looking at everything in the red would be provided by the RU PTO. The cost estimate for this project is about $69,000 with a 10% contingency it bumps it up to about $76,000. Um, as you can see there's a lot of cost in there for fixing the old playground area. We got to um, clean that up, put the new dirt and sod back in as well as create the new playground. The PTO is looking at funding about $15,000 of this project. As far as a project schedule, we're looking at releasing this tomorrow if approved tonight. Um, we'll take bids on June 15th, and the construction time period is going to be a variable right now because with the playground contractor, sometimes it's better to do in the fall, sometimes it's better to wait till next year to do the project. So we're going to take two bid dates on that and see where our best pricing comes in. So with that being said, are there any questions? Is this part of a is this part of a master plan 
This is like okay, a three-phased three plan for the playground out there, and it's the final phase. I don't foresee doing any other projects out there unless it's minor maintenance for the playground. Okay, and we're covering most of the costs except for the PTO, who would just be adding on to that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're basically providing the design, the ADA, the stuff that we would normally do anyway as a school district. Okay. Now, I was approached by the PTO and one of my charitable organizations to donate to this, and they said that what they were adding was for additional age groups which weren't best served by the playground that was currently there. I'm not sure where they came up with that. All of our playgrounds that we do at the elementary are from kindergarten till fifth grade. They're made for that. I think the stuff that they're looking at buying is more for older kids because it's a lot of upper strength and climbing kind of play events. So I'm not quite sure why they came up with that. Well, maybe they were, I couldn't remember if they said they were going for the preschool age or the fifth grade age, but they said that. The older kids is what they're looking at right now. Yes. Yeah. yeah. If you, I don't know if we can get that. Yeah, this is the second playground equipment. Any other questions for the board? It's funded by Pepple. Yes. And before we would start, the RU PTO needs to donate the money to the school district so we have the funding available when it's time to go. If there's no other questions, we'll go ahead and close our side, I guess. And I would ask if there's uh, anyone in the audience who would like to uh, make any comments about the plan specifications and form of contract for bid for this proposal. Seeing none, we will close the public hearing. Thank you, Stacy. I will now open the regular meeting of May 23rd, 2017 for the Council of Community School District. Mr. Wilson, please call the roll. Mr. Grove? Present. Mr. LaFerla? Present. Mr. Kazire? Present. Ms. Riley? Present. Mr. Hansen? Present. Mr. Arthur? Present. Uh, please join me uh, for a brief moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. And I would say since we recently lost a former employee and uh, who was recent sub, uh, maybe keep them in your thoughts. Thank you all. And now Dr. Bruckner will lead us in our We Are Proud of Our Schools and our introductions. Dr. Bruckner. Thank you very much. I am, these people did not all come to hear about the Rue Playground. I know you probably <laughs> thought they did. They came to honor some very important employees and some important students. So I am going to start by telling you we're going to recognize four adults tonight. Um, one of them is not our employee, and she is being recognized tonight as our Volunteer of the Year. So let me please ask Nicole Hughes to come here and let me talk about her.
We think it's important that we model the fact that Im our volunteers are very important to us. So let me tell you about Nicole. She is the parent of a second grader and a preschooler, and she's been a volunteer at College View Elementary for three years. Here are some of the things that her nominators said about her. Nicole is actively involved in the College View PTO and IB Parent Board and volunteers during class parties and field trips. While we appreciate all that Nicole does at College View, it's the work she does outside of our school that's truly exceptional and makes an impact on all students and teachers in the Council Bluffs Community School District. Nicole is a vocal advocate for schools in the Council Bluffs community and beyond. She's extremely knowledgeable and an informed parent, and she doesn't hesitate to share the positive experiences her family has had with other parents. She's encouraged families both inside and outside Council Bluffs Community School District to send their children to College View. She's a vocal advocate for the International Baccalaureate Program. In an article in the Daily Nonpareil regarding the expansion of the IB program to middle years, Nicole is quoted as saying, the continuation of the IB program not only benefits my children, but I think it will also develop our community. It will encourage highly educated people to move to our city and send their kids to the schools because of the reputation of the IB program. Nicole's creativity and innovative ideas have helped the students, staff, and parents at College View to have a deeper understanding of the role IB plays at home. Nicole sees the importance of and doesn't hesitate to advocate for funding for all schools. In a letter to the editor, she pointed out that the school funding not only benefits her children, but also furthers community development. This winter, Nicole advocated for all public schools in the state of Iowa as she attended legislative coffee sessions and wrote another letter to the editor, encouraging senators and representatives to vote against school vouchers. Nicole is also a member of Parents for Great Iowa Schools. Nicole's contributions as a volunteer are unique and are valued by our school community. As an international baccalaureate school, we expect our entire school community to be part of the program. Nicole does this by being knowledgeable about our school and their needs, communicating our needs, and talk, taking action within the school and community and beyond. Nicole is supported here tonight by College View Principal Sue Rice, IB Coordinator Aaron Schoenig, and family members. And so, Nicole, I am honored to give you the 2017 Volunteer of the Year Award. And I'd invite Butch and Barry, Butch Laquana and Barry Cleveland to come up because they have something very nice to give you. Here. Thank you very much. Nicole serves as a role model for what we would like many, many parents to do. And in order to get legislation going in the right direction next year, we're going to have to need s some more Nicole Hughes. So let me tell you now about our 2017 Substitute of the Year. A school district cannot survive with having an army of substitute teachers that come in and help us on a daily basis. And tonight, I want you to meet Carol Duronsole, who is our 2017 Substitute of the Year. Carol. When Diana and I got to go visit Carol um, last week at Longfellow, is that where you were? Edison, see? She goes somewhere different every day. When we walked in bearing gifts, she said, oh, the teacher isn't here today. And we said, oh, we're here to see you. <laughs> And here's what we said. <laughs> Carol is dedicated to serving students in the Council Bluffs School District by providing a productive and safe learning environment when their assigned classroom teacher is gone. Carol filled a long-term sub-position at Hoover for 12 weeks in the spring of 2017. 
She collaborated with the team, ensured plans were prepared, delivered strong instruction so students didn't fall behind, and communicated with parents. Plus, students loved her. Carol came to school with a positive attitude and was always willing to help in any way needed. Another nominator said, we were short a floating substitute this year as we conducted peer observations at Rue. On one day, when Carol ended up as an extra sub at Longfellow, she didn't hesitate to step into the classrooms at Rue, study the plans, deliver instructions seamlessly, and offer to help in other areas throughout the building. This is one example of Carol's flexibility and dedication to serve all of our kids. Carol, we couldn't do it without substitute teachers, and you are a star. So you are our substitute teacher of the year. And I will invite my two friends to come up and give you an If you didn't hear, Carol kept saying she couldn't do it without our teachers, so. Let me tell you about our 2017 support staff member of the year, Luann Ruff. Luann, would you come up and let me talk about you? <laughs> Luann has been with the Council of Schools since 1990. Here's what some of Luann's nominators said about her. Luann is a very dedicated employee. She cares deeply for students and staff. In numerous assignments throughout the years for our school district, Luann has worked both one-on-one -on -one with special needs students and within the special education classrooms, providing support at the elementary, middle, and high school years. Luann goes above and beyond when working daily with the students. On numerous occasions, she spends her own money to provide students with positive reinforcements for meeting expectations that she has set for them. This has helped increase the success of those students. Luann doesn't hesitate to assist any student who may be struggling. She's active within the school. She's always willing to stay after school to work with students who may need help or personal support to finish a project. Luann definitely exemplifies our district's theme this year, All Our Kids. A former colleague shared, Luann is very dedicated to the students she works with and has high expectations, but she's super fun. She's currently working one-on-one -on -one with a special needs student. She makes sure her student is safe, helps her with iPad and Visio machine, and keeps her up in classes. The student said the following, Mrs. Ruff is a really good para because no matter what I need, she is there for me, and she gets the job done. She comes to work very positively and wants me to do my best. And that student was there when we made the presentation and was extremely pleased. Luann is supported here tonight by principal from Thomas Jefferson, Todd Barnett, other colleagues, sister Lori Dreger, husband Andy, and mother Jean. And Luann, on behalf of the Board of Education and the Community Ed Foundation, I have for you something in this box. Council Bluffs Community School District Support Staff Member of the Year 2017. And if you come over here, I bet they might have something else for you. Again, on behalf of the Community Education Foundation, I'm Dave Becker, the President of the Board of Education. Thank you. Congratulations.
And finally, this person has a cheering section here. Let me tell you about <laughs> Jeff Bo. Jeff, would you please come here? Within minutes of this announcement, this was uh, really all over Facebook. It went viral right away. <laughs> and people were saying all across the community, wow, what a great, great recipient. <coughs> so let me tell you about Jeff. Jeff has been in, a teacher in the Council West School since 1994, and here's what some people say about him. Jeff embodies the spirit of our district mission in a way that's an example and inspiration to us all. He is a lifelong learner dedicated to continuous improvement in his profession. Jeff is constantly learning, taking advantage of CBU classes, summer academy, and other training opportunities. He implements new learning, gathers implementation data, and reflects to improve learning for every student. He's one of the most positive people in our school, supportive of both staff and students. He volunteers for numerous committees and is present at countless events. I have watched him lead his advisory students at Kern in projects to support a variety of causes, help out with parent-led booster club activities, and champion any and all student ideas to better the school. His humor and passion complement his caring and nurturing nature. He's a bright light in our faculty, a source of joy for us all. The relationship he builds with students are genuine, grounded in trust. He gets to know his students. He takes pride in the fact that he knows their interests, families, and goals. And he continues to email students after they leave Kern to check in with them and provide them words of encouragement. He is constantly advocating for student needs and the improvement of student learning. Jeff is a true professional, lifelong learner, student advocate, positive culture builder, and loyal member of Council Bluffs Community Schools. He is supported here tonight by current principal Carrie Newman, other current colleagues, Fred Baker, Val Carolyn, Jean Burns, Amy Jacobson, as well as his sister Diana Behart, Beekert. I can tell you when we were in his classroom and I was reading those words, there were people in his classrooms just as there were people here tonight nodding because it's just so very true. So Jeff, on behalf of the Board of Education and the community I have this trophy that says Licensed Staff Member of the Year 2017, Jeff Bow. And I'll invite these two gentlemen up to give you some Congratulations to all of you. Tonight's the fun part, but come back in August when Luann and Jeff get to share <laughs> words of wisdom <laughs> with the world and about 1,200 of their closest friends. <laughs> we are very pleased to have you all here. And we're pleased that you get to meet some wonderful students. So if you don't mind, board, let me tell you about some Student Star Awards. Let me tell you first about All State Speech for 2017. It is my pleasure to introduce to you a group of students who have earned the designation of all state in the Iowa Speech Contest. These students are here with us tonight as among the best in the state of Iowa. In order to qualify for all state, talented teacher, these talented teenagers have advanced from districts to state and had two of the three judges deem the performance as outstanding. In a typical year, approximately 400 performances make all state out of an original 9,000 entries. Our all staters this year include Kylie Short for radio broadcasting. <laughs> Kylie, come see me.
Kelsey Hansen is a two-category all-stater for radio broadcasting and for expository address. Jamie Katzenstein is a winner for storytelling. <laughs> the next young man made Allstate last year as well in the category of group improv. This year, Russell Holmes performed in storytelling. Russell. Congratulations to all our outstanding performers as well as their coaches. Would you stand Dirk Waller and Christy Harris? <laughs> Speech was my favorite in, in high school, so maybe you grow up to be superintendents. <laughs> Take some good pictures. <laughs> Take some good pictures. We are still proud of our schools. Let me tell you about the State History Day honors and national qualifiers for 2017. Students from Kern and Abraham Lincoln have earned honors at the State History Day competition that was held May 8th in Des Moines. Congratulations to Anna Newby and Grace Ozello for making the finals in the junior group documentary category with a project on Lewis Hine and the NCLC focusing a lens on child labor. They know the drill. <laughs> Congratulations to Kayla Whitworth, who received the Outstanding Project Award on Rural Education with her project, May Francis, Reading, Writing, and Rural Education. Congratulations to Jude Ryan for receiving the Outstanding Project Award on Agricultural Education for his documentary, Troubled Fields. In the high school division, Mia Kawamitsu and Anna Bays of Abraham Lincoln High School qualified for National History Day competition to be held in College Park, Maryland. Mia's project, A Ray of Hope, focused on Governor Ray and his work with Vietnamese refugees in the 1970s. She also received the Outstanding Project Award on an Iowa topic. So, Mia, come up and see. <laughs> Anna's project focused on the work of Native American bones repatriation and Iowan Maria Pearson. A fun fact, two years ago, special awards were presented to Maya and Anna, Maya for the Outstanding Project in Civil Rights and Anna for the Outstanding Project in Social History. Anna, can you? Parents, you can come in front of the table. It's okay. Come on up. Yeah, come on up. We should say a special thank you to the lady on her knees here, <laughs> Deb Masker.
as, as these students know, and as many of the parents know, Deb eats, sleeps, and drinks on uh, History Day. She loves Iowa history, and she loves helping students discover it. So, Deb, we're very pleased. What a successful year. Good job. Our final Proud of Our Schools moment tonight is I'm going to invite some, a representative from College View Elementary School to give you a snapshot about the work that they're doing related to International Baccalaureate and a report that they're working on for their organization. So I think it's Aaron, Sue. Dave, do I need to turn this part off at all? <laughs> no, you do. Okay, thank you guys for letting me come tonight. Um, I just wanted to speak very briefly about um, College View Self Study, which is part of the evaluation process for the IB program. Um, as I've mentioned before at meetings when I've been here in the past, um, we are, our program is always, un, we're constantly reviewing and refining our program. And right now, um, we're in the place in, in this little cycle here where we're doing the self-study process. Um, and so then I'll explain what that is in just a moment. And then next fall, we will have a school visit from IB. Um, and then we'll kind of refine our program from there. And then the cycle continues. Um, for the self-study process, um, as a school, we have used the IB program standards and practices, which are essentially the rules that IB gives us, and we've evaluated how we're doing. Um, so we've um, identified areas of strength and um, identified areas of weakness. We've used the areas that we feel we need to, um, areas which we feel we need to grow and have developed an action plan um, to move forward with that. And um, IB will come in, and when they visit in the fall, they will come in and they will look at our self-study, the, the information we gave them. They will visit with teachers, with parents, with students, they'll visit classrooms, and then they will say, this is how we think you're doing. Um, and they will give us um, rec recommendations on things that we can improve, and they'll give us accommodations on things that they think that we are doing very well. Um, and again, that feedback will, feed, uh, will kind of um, drive us forward in the years to come. And the one thing I wanted to kind of talk to you guys about tonight, the people who are involved in the self-study process is really everyone who has anything to do with the school. Um, so administrators, um, both teaching and non-teaching staff, um, we've, um, all year long, the College View teachers have been kind of evaluating our program. We've been um, gathering evidence as to how we're doing at meeting the standards. Um, our IB parent board, Nicole, our volunteer of the years, is on our IB parent board. They provided feedback. Um, we've surveyed all of the parents at College View. We've surveyed students at College View about not only what it is they've learned, but how they have learned. Um, and the one group of people that we really still need some feedback from is the governing body. Um, so I have just a brief survey that at some point tonight, if you don't mind um, filling out and just turning into Dr. Bruckner at the end of the night, um, one of the big um, practices that deals with the board is that our school, the school keeps the board informed. And so, you know, I occasionally come and give you guys updates about what's going on, but if there's ever a way that we can do a better job of keeping you informed, um, any ideas that you have in that regard, we would absolutely welcome that feedback. So, and, and that's all I have for you. Any questions about the self-study process or anything IB related in general? I forget, how long have we been in existence here? So this is our sixth year really? with the program. We were, we, our first two years though, we're a candidate school. Sure. So this is our fourth year as an authorized school. Um, so IB does this evaluation. 
after four years the first time, and then after that it will be every five years. So every five years you go through this process. Yep. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you guys for taking the time to do this. I think um, again, we might have second. one comment. Thank you. Well, Erin's passing that out, I'll give her a kudos. She is not only the IB coordinator at College View, but she is the coordinator at Carter Lake, which is moving right along, and she is the program lead, so she's helping the two middle school IB coordinators as we get those programs up and running. So you do a great job for us, thank you. That's the end of We Are Proud of Our Schools. But we are proud of our schools. We are proud of our schools. Um, very good, thank you. Um, now we will move to approve our agenda. Is there a motion? I move approval of our agenda as presented. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Oops, yeah, maybe, thank you. Um, if there's no discussion, Dean, please call the roll. We did just oh, I'm sorry. Oh. The echo is killing me here. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. And then we have approval of our agenda. Uh, now we have approval of our minutes for the regular meeting of May 9th, 2017. Is there a motion? I move that the minutes of the regular meeting of May 9th, 2017 be approved as presented. Thank you, Susan. There's a second. 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 Are there any uh, discussion or changes? song. All right. Uh, all in favor of uh, approval of the minutes, say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. And the motion is carried. Um, now we have the public participation portion of the meeting. Um, opportunity for the board. I'm just I, I agree. Maybe that was better. Now for the public to address the board. Is there anyone out there who wants to address the board? Or is it just a full room? All right, thank you. Now we go to superintendent's report and student achievement. We're still echoing. Yeah. Um, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Jason Ford, who has other people that he's going to introduce. Is this volume? Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Not as loud. Good evening, board. Dr. Bretner, thank you for this opportunity to share a little bit about some very important work. Um, I won't be offering any, che any checks. Uh, we won't have any awards, but I can promise you that the information we, sh we share this evening is very, very valuable. Um, you know, I've been involved in lots of teams um, this past school year and we've done lots and lots of great work and we've shared some of that with you through presentations and, and board minutes and so forth. But I would count this as a, a, a top five project that I've been involved in, uh, not only because of the work itself, uh, but because we've partnered with some amazing people and I'll introduce them in just a moment. Um, I wanna say some public thank yous. Um, first, I wanna publicly thank our CTE curriculum specialist, Deb Goodman, uh, who's been instrumental in this work uh, all the way from the beginning uh, with the original vision and helping uh, myself and others create that vision as well as the follow through on through writing the curriculum. So thanks to Deb. Also a public thank you to uh, Lori Shields who works with our CB chamber. Um, she wasn't able to join us this evening, uh, but she's been instrumental along with that. Natalie Harris, uh, who's from Iowa Western, who has helped us with uh, the whole process and the program and uh, regenerating a new logo and many other things. So thank you, Natalie. And then finally, I want to thank Kevin Forstall from TS Bank for joining us this evening. Um, he's helped us uh, create a prototype that we're going to share a little bit with you about. Uh, and then also TS Bank, a public thank you to them and all their executives for support in um, along the way and letting us uh, create this vision. So thank you. 
And then also I want to highlight some internal people, uh, Mr. Tim Ham Hamilton, uh, Dr. Sandy Day, who works uh, with us, and uh, Student Family Services, and they've partnered with us um, along the way as well as to help provide some other summer opportunities um, that you'll also hear about. And finally, I want to thank Dr. Corey Vorthman, who's been inspirational and instrumental in helping myself and the team stay close to our Strategic Plan 5.0, uh, making sure that the work we did was aligned with the work uh, that he did, which you heard about last month. And um, in particular, uh, Strategic Plan 5.2, I know you heard about it, but I want to read it because it's so, I think, critical to the work we did. It says, develop community-wide cross-sector partnerships to build college and career readiness that will address the needs of the community and make post-secondary attainment inescapable for all students. So that's the beginning of some of the work that we've done with this group. Uh, speaking of readiness, you'll notice uh, above where it says Grow CB, uh, in the past, uh, that was graduation required of our workforce. And what the team felt like is, um, not that we've accomplished that completely, but it was time for some revisioning uh, behind the Grow CB program. Uh, which was a great idea, but we wanted to begin to think about as an organization and as a community, um, it's so much more than graduating from high school. We know the world we li live in, uh, it takes more than that. And so the idea of partnering with the Chamber and others to generate readiness in our workforce uh, was a subtle but an important change. Um, the actual logo has been developed. That will be unveiled publicly uh, in partnership with the Chamber at a later date. So while we have many commitments through these programs, uh, we want to come to you and share three critical commitments. Um, first of all, we are committed as a Council of Bluffs Schools to create a continuum of work-based learning. Uh, we want to further our community partnerships, and that's why we have some visitors that are going to share this evening, as well as just ensuring we have a quality, real-life experiences for our students. So the first thing that I'm going to speak to is this idea of pr providing a continuum. You might remember uh, in an earlier presentation, we talked about work-based learning and a continuum of options for students. There was some CT legislation that came forth in the uh, six ser service areas. Um, we're committed in Council Bluff Schools to having curriculum in all six service areas. We have five of the six currently, and as a part of that continuum, we want that curriculum to start theoretically in middle school, and in some areas it does, but certainly throughout high school. And then by senior year, we want students to have an opportunity for a capstone experience that is related to some of the th things you see above. Um, that took a lot of hard work and visioning. Um, it, it's easy to say, and it's hard to work out those details. The people that are here this evening helped us work out those details. First of all, community-wide events. We have done in the past and continue to do amazing things in our community related to work-based learning. For instance, I'll cite just a few. You're very aware of the fifth grade career fair. Um, it really is uh, institutionalized in our city, and Council Bluff schools really are the ones that envision that in partnership with others. Um, it's a great event. That continues on into eighth grade in something called an eighth grade career forum. We partner with Natalie, Iowa Western, and many others to ensure um, that that fifth grade experience doesn't stop in fifth grade, but, but is a golden thread that goes throughout uh, high school. Um, another great experience. Um, in addition, we also have uh, the College Crossroads, which you're familiar with, which serves eighth through 12th graders. Trades Day with ninth through 12th graders. College Decision Day, which is also part of our programming and is really very uh, common anymore. Uh, we have future ready initiatives and curriculum that you heard about from Dr. Vorthman that's going to start in sixth grade. And finally, most recently, we were involved in the Career Rocket program, um, which was an incredible event, and Council Bluffs, I'll just say, really showed up. Council Bluffs schools and our community. Uh, Deb and I were able to go over to the Greater Omaha Chamber recently, and they invited us over, and really, um, they wanted to know how we did it. Uh, they wanted 10,000 events in the greater Omaha area. Um, and the numbers vary depending on who you talk to, but I will say we could, we could say with confidence that we achieved much more than they thought. 
I originally had set a stretch goal for Council Bluff Schools at 2,500. I thought I heard a snicker in the room, and that really kind of got my goat a little bit. Dr. Bartner and, and Deb and I uh, met with the members, and then uh, in the true spirit of Dr. Bartner, she committed us to 5,000 uh, experiences. And uh, clearly, uh, but we had over, we, we almost had 11,000 experiences. So they asked Deb and I to come over and say, how on earth did you do that? Small community, you exceeded our expectations. And so we were able to share um, the great things that our team did uh, to make that happen. So again, we're doing great things with community-wide events. Uh, one other thing we're doing is we're trying to expand tours. We've always done tours, but we're trying to think outside the box with tours. You might remember we took some students to Warren Distribution, um, which is a manufacturing organization uh, in town. And unfortunately, society doesn't allow those tours as, as much as they used to. Um, Deb and I were able to gain access because of that month. But one of the things we're exploring is the idea of virtual tours. And uh, as a part of Career Rocket, uh, we did an experimental uh, virtual tour, um, the only one I think in the area. And we had uh, one of our staff members go in with a GoPro camera and actually take a tour, a virtual tour. We had students back at AL and Thomas Jefferson High School in the auditorium taking the tour with them, and then afterwards an opportunity for a question and answer. So, um, we have people that are thinking creatively and uh, innovatively, so tours will be to continue to be part of what we do. Job shadows, we've done that with our health science programs, and we continue to do those things uh, through CHI and other opportunities. And then finally, internships. Uh, we'll hear a little bit from Kevin this evening about the TS Bank opportunity. Um, you're familiar with the UNMC opportunity that we've had in the past. This summer, we're adding two, which is really exciting. There's a Gallup internship, which we had a student. It's competitive. We had a student selected for the Gallup. Uh, which will be life-changing for that young lady. And then finally, most recently, we have uh, an internship for one of our students in a program called Omaha Builders Foundation. Uh, it's special and unique because there's only one other uh, situation in the nation in Washington, D.C., and most recently they came to Omaha. Dr. Bruckner uh, showed some interest. Deb and I agreed. Uh, Deb worked behind the scenes to help the student apply, and, and one student was accepted. So. Uh, we're just making great strides in our continuum. I mentioned we're trying to further our partnerships with our community. Um, the Grow CB program, you might remember, was a great program that was uh, initiated by Council Bluff Schools. Uh, we partnered with some other school districts and with the chamber, and um, it was time for a revision. It was a good program, uh, but we wanted to figure out a way to have some of the programs integrate together under the banner of work-based learning. Um, what we did is we took the original program with the certified membership, we collapsed that into one program, and then we expanded into two additional uh, layers, one we called the gold, another we called platinum. Uh, the TS Bank experience you'll hear about this evening is really a prototype that houses itself in the platinum membership. I won't go through all the details in terms of each layer, but they're in your board packet, but essentially a certified member um, is a business. What Deb and I, our strategy was, is what we found is when we went to businesses, uh, before we could even start talking about an internship, um, the conversation would be shut down because internships, uh, there's lawsuits, there's all these rules as to why organizations and businesses want to be, have to be in their, in their uh, thinking a no. And so what we said is, let's have every conversation, whenever we meet with an organization or business, let's, let's have every conversation be a yes. What do we need to do to ensure a yes? Because they want to be a yes. They wouldn't be meeting with us. And so that certified membership just focused on common sense things as a community, like we will make sure that our employees, our student employees, uh, don't work um, during the school day. They don't work long evenings, realizing that school is the priority. Um, we incentivize, if appropriate, grades, um, attendance, those common sense things, so they're always a yes. And then what we try to do is we try to build back from the platinum, which is the true internship experience, like I said, that you'll hear about this evening. And the gold is somewhere in between where business can support job shadows, guest speakers, uh, virtual tours, like I said before. So we're doing a lot around Grow, CP, grow CB. Finally, we're trying to ensure quality real-life learning for all of our students. 
This evening, we'll hear from two of our partners for this commitment. Kevin Forrestal from TS Bank is going to discuss specifically the data science internship that we work closely with, with him and his organization on. And after that, Dr. Sandy Day will present on a few of our other summer work-based learning opportunities. Kevin? Thank you for having me tonight. <clears throat> I apologize, I have a little bit of a cold, so. Um, anyways, the data science internship. First, answering the question a little bit, what is data science? A lot of people have probably heard about computer science. There's business intelligence out there. There's big data. Um, there's software programming, and it's kind of, the middle, it's kind of an alchemy of all of these type of things. And so there's big data, and especially in a banking institution, there is a lot of data. And um, most bankers would say they're just swimming in it. And so there's so much of it that, and we've had a good analytics team in the corner of the bank for a long period of time, and now we're looking at deploying that analytics across our entire organization. And and so what that means is we need to have a concerted effort to make a lot of progress around managing all of our data and making sense out of it. And so we take big data and there's a lot of programming that um, our team does, but the prospective students would do, where they're using the programming to connect to a database, applying statistics to it, applying business logic to it, and presenting that information in a usable format because there's so many people, I'm sure, everybody here could testify that not everybody can see a huge sheet of data and interpret sense out of it. And so ideally what our team tries to do is make sense out of the data, um, use the data to help with decision making, um, find opportunities, ideally create automation, which provides a lot of efficiency, reduces risk. Um, so there's many different um, achievements or I guess value adds we could have um, from the deliverables that the analytics team is providing and that, and that the interns could provide as well. And most of what we do, it's, it's very project centric, which is neat because you can kind of see over a life cycle, the beginning, the middle, and the end of a project, you can see how a business unit is taking a hold of it, adopting it, making sense out of it. And there's a lot of times an iterative work, um, working within the different business units. So the really cool thing, I think, for the internship, I mean, definitely for our analytics team and anybody that we hire, but an experience that the interns would have as well, not only would they have experience to a great analytics team, they'd also have experience to people, for instance, in our marketing department, in our operations department, in our HR, and finance, and accounting, and so on and so forth, because those are the people in our organization that we are serving, they're our clients, and so it'll be great experience for the internship. And, and the other cool thing is it's a small team, so it's not like they'll get drowned in it. Um, there'll be about four individuals on the direct team that they're working with, and I'm really excited for them. It's just a great, really just a, a great team of people really um, wanting to help each other out. Always, the whole team is always really hungry to learn themselves. Um, we have um, people on their team with a doctorate, with masters, and a lot of different degrees, and they're always hungry to learn, and they're always hungry to share a lot of information, too and to be the teacher, so. Is there any questions? Mr. Forstall, um, oh, the, um, when we had talked in the past about the, uh, what they were doing over at UNO with their, with their data science program, um, how, how similar do you think this is gonna be, the exposure that, that this student, students will get doing this compared to what they might get in a college internship? Just curious. Well, I'm, I'm not sure exactly in the college internship, but I would say as far as degrees, yeah. um, one thing is we've, we've really grown our team out of nothing over the last two years, and so we've interviewed over a dozen prospective data scientists, and some of them were able to take what they learned and they had put it to use on their, their own and they were able to generate value add code with it. But I would say that was a select few of the group. And so many of the people, they had textbook knowledge, but they'd never really put it to work to do anything with it. And so you had people um, that had a lot of the right pieces. They'd never really put all the ingredients together to make something with it. So there was a little bit of a gap. Um, and in this, 
they'll have to take, like we will provide training on the job, so a lot of tutorials and things like that, so there'll be tutor tutorial based training and also what we'd call like instructor based training. So there'll be a lot of learning, but then all the learning is geared towards actual projects. So they'll put it to work. They'll have to take what they've learned as far as the concepts and the tools and use those tools to solve prog problems. And one thing that specifically in this field um, that probably academia hasn't yet addressed is that um, all of the teachings are geared towards perfect problems where you know you kind of you have a tool and you back into a problem to use that tool to solve and you know in the business place it's not always a clear perfect problem and you have to be creative you have to be novel and so there'll be really good opportunities where they take the learning and they have to do a lot of brainstorming and maybe use a combination of different tools to figure out how to solve a problem and the great thing is there is a team of experienced professionals that can guide them through that, so it's not like they'll be lost in the woods either. So I think it'll be a good balance between the two. I'm assuming this, this the students we will put through this will be heads and tails above other kids that are trying to go into that field in college, just through that experience. Dramatically, I think so, yeah. That's excellent. One summer internship, or there's two. two. There, there'll be two interns, and the our our goal really is to have this the first year, and that we'd love for it to be a a rotational cycle over time. And I'm really excited because I think <coughs> this summer will be a great experience, but I'm more confident that it'll be even a better experience down the road as well as we learn more about it. I think. You know, over this summer, I'm sure there'll be things that we learn that we could do better, you know, next time around, and I think I look forward to that. Are you looking for students with a particular background, or are you just kind of open to different scenarios? Yeah, and just to clarify, we have um, talked to a lot of students oh, and kind okay. of gone through a filtering process to identify some, and the one, I would say, a lot of them, they had a passion for programming. Um, a lot of it is, even if they weren't required to do it, they would probably be doing it on their own time. And um, I would say the spectrum was between somebody that wanted to be a software developer, and so that involves procedural-based code, as far as you're writing code to generate an outcome you know, with it. And um, on the other hand, another student was just really passionate more on the pure data science side and um, that element. And, and a lot of it, too, I would say, um, between the Khan Academy and a lot of other sources, um, there's just great opportunities to learn and enticing ones. So some of them are, you can download a classic arcade video game, rewrite some of the rules of the game, and the game will operate differently. And so I think um, there's a lot of great ways where the kids have been able to get their hands on that and have fun with it. And um, also, one thing I think is really cool about the program, and it's, I think, good for the school district to know as far as um, it's kind of harvesting some seeds that they planted a long time ago is one of the students, I think, he was kind of the first round of students in seventh grade. He got exposure to programming in a lot of languages in the school system. And I think he might have been um, the first year that that was offered. And so it's neat that this has kind of come into fruition out of that program within the school district. And, you know, my awareness of, you know, that situation is, um, that that specific class fostered a lot of hunger in him to learn more about it over time. So, thank you. Good feedback. Okay. Thank you. Um, and having I guess seen what I've seen of this, um, been impressed with how much passion I think this caused in our team, um, and love to see us get other businesses to want to have that same level of passion for this concept. Um, you know, just to really help us promote everything that we all do anyway, you know, for better employees and better students, so. Absolutely. Thank you. Just a couple quick related comments. Um, behind the scenes, and Kevin alluded to this, um, there were a whole host of things that we did, our organization and TS Bank, in order to ensure quality. One of the things that we knew in terms of, to what you said, Mr. Arthur, the path forward into enlisting others to come along with us was to ensure quality. And so we know we have a, an amazing computer science program and curriculum 
um, that starts in middle school. I mean, Ms. Newman's here this evening. We, we've done some walkthroughs recently at Kern, and the things that our middle schoolers are doing related to programming and hardware is incredible. Um, and the, the fruits of that are beginning to bear themselves out. Um, it was a competitive process. Um, there was a process that was put in place working with TS Bank's HR department um, to ensure we were, we were able to get their yes also. And um, through the competitive process, and of course we selected students that had a background and an interest in computer science, but also had some interest in math, particularly statistics. And um, as a result, we were able to select two quality candidates that we feel confident are gonna do a great job for TS Bank this summer, so. With that, we'll transition to Dr. Day. Dr. Ford, can I ask you a question? Um, so how, once we have these these internships, is that then the onus on the employer? No, or actually, that, that, was, that was part of, we knew, again, this is the idea of how can we get more businesses to say yes, and one of the things we know is the school district has to own most of that work. Um, for instance, there's a whole curriculum that's in your board packet, um, and there's more to it, obviously, but the sample's in there uh, that Deb and a team has worked on to ensure that uh, the student doesn't just show up and um, partner on the projects, although that is critical, uh, but there's other components with self-reflection, with learning, uh, learning about the whole business, like Kevin said, the industry, the opportunities. Um, data scientist is um, an amazing uh, field that's in the future. If you do some searches, it's really, depending on where you look, a top one or top two field in the future. And so, um, but yes, the onus is really on the district. We've, we've, uh, we've asked, their businesses will have to do some things, but the heavy lifting really is on, on us, on the teachers, and on the students. Hi, everybody. Hello. So it was a few weeks ago, I think I was here talking about 21st century as it was partnering with the school district for summer school. And so some of this probably looked extremely familiar to you. And in your written report, um, I didn't have some of the details for the businesses that the um, afternoon credit recovery students will be doing. Uh, they're offered it as well as our other students will be doing in June and I did want to share that with you. But just to remind you how these experiences came about so we did get our funding for 21st century uh, for high school. This was our first year, and we began a conversation with Iowa Western and also with this lovely young lady, Natalie, over here with the, um, oh, I bet it interdisciplinary inter intermediary intermediary network. network. Thank you. I can get there half the time and half the time I can't. So thank you, my friends, for getting me there. At any rate, she brought to the table a conversation uh, and a whole bunch of businesses that were ready to host our students after they had spent the learning mor the morning learning with professors at Iowa Western, and then they broke for lunch, uh, and then they went to uh, these experiences. And I mentioned that we did an evaluation on this, and one of the things, the students loved it, we had about 56 students last year. One of the things they asked us to try to do was to build in some sort of credit. So we worked with teaching and learning here to see if we could allow some credit and we're able to, on a 60-hour experience, which if you add those two full, week, two full weeks together, because uh, they're each about six hours a day, five days a week, so 30 and 30, we'll get to 60 there. And, and what that's going to mean for the students is they're doing that morning learning, but the, the work-based experiences are all about reflection and how this fits, or in some cases, doesn't fit into their future plan. Uh, it's our belief that it's as important for students to learn what they really don't want to do uh, as it is what they really do want to do. Uh, so that's how it got started. Uh, we've expanded um, UNO's. Uh, the first one this summer is going to be uh, at UNO the week of the 12th of June. Uh, Iowa Western comes up the week of the 19th of July. And then the um, Creighton experience will be happening in August. And Clarkson is still nailing down a date with us, and they will all be about um, healthcare careers. We're going to be focusing on some of the 200 healthcare careers. So if you don't mind, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about those June experiences. And these are students that I believe, I believe Mr. Grove might have asked if they're open for um, 
students who are not in credit recovery, and they are. So these are, are gonna be afternoon experiences. So if, if a student is in credit recovery at TJ in the morning, they'll break for lunch, they'll go and meet their afternoon uh, supervisor, teacher, youth development worker, whoever they're assigned to. They're gonna do a little bit of research on their Chromebook regarding what that business is that they're going to visit. Some of our sign-ons are Pasta Amore. I can't wait for that one. Uh, we also have Arbor Aesthetics. They're gonna teach us a little bit about how to be a certified arborist. Um, some of the things you would expect to see, uh, hospitals have volunteered to host us, but we do have a couple of really neat things. A uh, digital marketing company in Lincoln has offered to step forward and give us a tour of not only their digital marketing and how that works, but how that interfaces with their regular printed marketing. And then if you don't mind, I'd like to just give a, a little bit of a plug to a company called Creations by Day. Yes, that's my son Garrett. My middle son Garrett is a welder. Garrett went to Central High School and went through the Career Center uh, in OPS and became a well. He loves welding. He's gotten certified in welding. He has his own business with three employees. He's going to host a session. I couldn't be prouder of him. So uh, some of our sessions are a little bit different in nature. And so at the time that the sessions conclude, we'll ask the students to turn in those reflections and how they think that's going to impact you know, themselves going forward. And, and, and also going forward, we're hoping to do this half-day model, the short model like we're doing in June. We're hoping to add that throughout the school year in our regular after-school experiences. Because remember, 21st century is all outside of regular school. Questions now or did you have any questions? Super. No questions. Thank you. So to just bring things full circle, like we said before, um, we're very committed as an organization uh, to make sure we do these three things. And uh, of course, we've, we've done many other things. And I, I want to say one final thank you to, to my team and others that aren't in the room, because it is some of the best work we've done. Um, it's, it's a great vision. Uh, it's very articulated to the point of the fine details. Uh, the truth is, I've talked to some of you privately about this, the truth is, is we, we do know and we acknowledge that really the journey down work-based learning in Council of Schools is just beginning. Uh, but we know that uh, any structure has a great foundation and um, we have created a great foundation. And so the path forward is, is promising and encouraging. Any final questions? Just one. If I understood you er, right earlier, the Grove CB is for the whole community. Yes. So any business, any any industry, any organization um, that wants to partner with us will have an opportunity to partner in some ways. Um, what about other schools in the community? Uh, other schools in the community have. Um, decided to pursue other options. Maybe in the future we would be open to that, uh, but right now Council Bus Schools has uh, done the visioning, has done the heavy lifting. Uh, and I appreciate that, but I'm just, when the, if the Chamber's involved, sometimes there's an implication that we meet needs of everybody? Absolutely, That's we, we went down that, that road, honestly, and um, we're always open to any partnership with any anybody in our community. Uh, they made some decisions to, to do some other things, and we didn't feel like we were going to uh, have that hold us back or wait, and so we oh, decided to re revision. And uh, I'm just curious. I would like to echo that because we we did realize we couldn't grow the Grove CB by ourselves, so we reached out to the chamber and to other school districts in the area and invited them to be part of it and. We just couldn't get it to go on it of its own accord. Um, and it was, we were trying very hard to share the lifting and the lifting wasn't being shared. So I appreciate that Jason and his team have kind of re revisioned it. And the reason, last year you may recall, we had a Gross CB Champion Award. We gave it to Menards um, because they had employed a lot of our um, students and they were following all of the suggestions we had. And this year, we're envisioning that differently, but we are very purposefully not making any kind of an award tonight because we want the chamber to really be at the table with us holding hands, um, and so we want them to be able to make that award. But when you hear about that award, you be thinking, Council Bus Council. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, we've made a good commitment. speech. I like it. <laughs> yeah, we're going to do our part. We're doing our part. We have, and we will continue to do our part. And we're hoping that our partners will partner with us and do their part. So, thank you, Wendy. When it comes to our business partnerships, is it do we strictly look at businesses on this side of the river, or will we accept a partnership with those in our neighboring cities as well? Well, I think in some cases we have already done that when we think about Gallup, um, UNMC, and so we're open to that. That's why we also have partnered with the Greater Omaha Chamber. Um, I think all of us have somewhat of a bias for our own community, and um, of course we'll lead with that. But we're focused on our students and the opportunities for our students, whether they're here or whether, you know, the, the arbitrary river doesn't really, uh, we're trying to make it irrelevant, um, as Dr. Barton has said many times. I just want to add, um, so happy about all these uh, parts that are tied around that uh, strategic plan five. Yes. That was a good group. So I'm yes. proud for all this excitement. <laughs> yes. Doing, so. wow. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <clears throat> we, you must have been some good leadership good there. I guess. You also may notice that it became one of the superintendent's goals that you'll hear about later tonight. I mean, you won't hear about it. You just heard about it. But <laughs> you, you have done a good job, board, in telling us that that was important and you wanted some progress done this year. And um, Jason, Corey, their team, our our partners have certainly made that happen. I guess I would I say, them. even though I'm a employee, um, just huge thanks to Kevin for spearheading this. I don't know how many hours he's put into this. Um, it's been a lot, and I've been real happy to see it. It's just a wonderful yeah. way to for you guys to give back. So thank you. And I failed to mention that at the beginning. I thought maybe Kevin might, but he's a humble person. It, the original idea actually was uh, conceived. Kevin approached us initially and said, "Hey, we." we might want to do something like this and um, we know a good idea when we hear it and we said absolutely what do we got to do and so thank you thank you all right now we move on to our informational presentations and first up is our facilities and construction report edit Stacy and Jared are going to wow us. Yeah. Do we have like a regular spot back there for Jared now? Okay. <laughs> Name plate. Yeah, give him a table tent. Boy, boy, you're ranking higher than me. Let's talk facilities. Um, a lot of the projects that we're going to talk about tonight are projects that we're anticipating doing coming up in the future. Um, the first one that we're going to talk about is potential roofing projects at Roosevelt and Wilson. Um, as you can see from the two diagrams below, we have two areas in red that we're looking at doing a replacement project in the very near future. Um, the one at Roosevelt is about a 25-year-old roof. The one at Wilson's about a 27-year-old roof. So they're very well nearing their end of life. Um, HGM's currently working on bid packages for both projects. We're looking at sending them po potentially out to bid in July. And depending upon um, the contractors, we'll look at probably doing them next spring, next summer. Um, Kern, lots of stuff going on at Kern right now. Um, this project is the exterior project at Kern with some miscellaneous interior work. Um, right now, if you go out to the building, you're going to see some folks working on the exterior, mainly on the east side of the building because we're trying to keep them away from the classroom side of the facility. Um, basically, they're removing all the old gypsum board soffits and they're um, power washing the outside of the building, getting ready to do some tuck pointing. Um, as you can see, uh, um, it was a beautiful day yesterday with the blue skies, and they're out there working. Our weather hasn't been real cooperative this last couple of weeks, so we're anticipating that they're going to be done in August on the exterior work, and they have to be done on the interior work, but they haven't started that yet, as that will start right after school's out. Also at Kern, we're working on the fire alarm, intercom, and clock project. 
Um, this is a similar project to what we did at Wilson last year. Um, ABC Electric of Council Bluffs is actually working on the project. They started in March, and they're approximately 50% finished with the clock system, 60% uh, with the intercom, and 30 with the fire alarm. And as soon as school gets out, they can really go gangbusters on the interior. Right now, they're kind of working in corridors, and they'll work after hours in the classrooms. Um, later this evening, you're going to be asked to approve a new furniture vendor. Um, basically, about five, six years ago, we sent out a bid packet for furniture vendors for the school district. And the furniture vend vendors basically help us with our summer and construction project pricing and bidding for furnishings. They also help us with new and innovative products for mobility within the classroom. And we sent out 12 bid packets, only got three back on bid day. All of them are great vendors. Um, they were very close in their packets and what they sent to us, and it was a real hard decision on who to select. Um, office interior design um, is, I don't know if you guys have been reading up there, one of the things that really struck us as impressive with them is they were really creative in their um, bid package they talked about fostering success and learning. They're really creative with their adaptable learning spaces. Um, the vendor that we would be working with, we've actually worked with her in the past as well. She used to work with Shepherd's Business Interiors, and she's very familiar with the school district and has helped us with a lot of our great products that we have currently within the facilities. Um, also within that packet, you'll see that we did do an apples to apples estimate between all three of the vendors and OID did come in at our um, less expensive out of the three. Moving on to our LED projects, we just finished up Kern this last month. In fact, I signed the rebate forms this morning and sent them off to MidAmerican. Um, we're basically working through details for Hoover and Bloomer this summer. We're hoping to get both of those done by the end of the summer. And this is kind of an interesting little data that we pulled off of our B3 programming. Um, Wilson, you can see in a comparison that we did from last year to this year, we've saved about $10,000 at Wilson in energy. And Rue, it's a little over 7000 in savings. Kern's a little bit misleading because I did just a month to month because we don't have a full year's data. Um, I see that number fluctuating probably a little bit closer to our Wilson number, and I'm guessing our weather was probably a little bit different the year before than it was this year. We maybe used a little bit more energy. But overall, we've saved about $20,000 this last year on energy with our LED projects. Uh, moving forward, we're currently working with MidAmerican and doing uh, site evaluations at some of the schools that we haven't done our LED projects at. Black Hills actually approached us last week about doing some evaluations at our two middle schools because they're our biggest natural gas users. And our local vendor, Rasmussen, has been also helping us with some potential building improvements. Um, Dr. Bruckner had asked about some other ideas for energy savings with the school district. And the one thing that we're kind of lacking right now is the human factor. Facilities can do a lot of things to help with the buildings, but until we get the staff and the students involved with um, taking a look at what they're using for energy, I think we're going to kind of plateau at some point in the near future. Uh, if you go out to energy.gov, you can put appliances in the, their little website, and you can kind of do estimates on how much appliances use. And uh, one of the things that I've noticed from other school districts around the area, they have policies for personal appliances within their classrooms. Um, they're kind of creative. Some say no appliances at all. Some say um, we'll do an annual fee for those appliances, kind of a best place to work. If you still want to use the appliance, we're not telling you you can't have it, but there might be a fee associated with it. Um, there's a lot of ideas out there. It's just a matter of how we would want to move forward with doing some of these. Um, another idea was doing a report card for the buildings to kind of show them 
what, how they're doing on a monthly basis. We can easily pull this information off of our B3 website. Um, we can look at a couple of different things. We can do their benchmark scores, peer rating, and energy star. Um, I don't know if they would want to do a competition between the buildings or maybe within themselves to say, hey, we're going to drop our energy use so many points every month. But I think there's some ways out there that we can engage the, the buildings on their energy use. Some potential projects that are going to happen this summer. Our IT folks are going to be updating the data phone and cameras at Kern. We have some miscellaneous concrete projects at Edison, AL, and Washington. Um, potentially some district furniture replacement. We're on our second year of radio replacement at the schools. We're trying to get all the schools on the same Motorola radios and charging stations so they can talk to each other. And um, we started a project over at TJ, the old train tracks. I'm sure if you guys have been over in that area, it's a little bit of a swamp right now. They're removing the rock over there and we're using them at the detention ponds down at the stadium. And of course our wet weather's not helping us out on either one of those projects right now. But we anticipate that those will be finished up this summer. Uh, and then we have a lot of moving going on this summer. We have um, special ed is doing some moves at Lewis and Clark as well as within TJ. And our IB programs that are starting up at the middle schools are doing some moving around as well. And then we have Jared here. He's going to do a fantastic job of presenting the athletic complex. He hasn't been here in a while to talk about it, but um, Jared. Well, good evening. I appreciate Stacy setting the bar nice and high for me. We'll do fine. All right. Uh, when I was looking through to put this together, I realized it has actually been almost exactly a year since I was here doing an overall presentation of where we're at on the stadium. Um, I came back uh, over the winter a few times to talk about some change orders, some large change orders to move stuff from C to B, and then the award of C. But uh, this spring, with a little bit of grass growing, the place looks very different than about 15 months ago when it was pretty much looked like a war zone. So uh, one of the things I tasked myself with this past spring was to kind of organize all of our photos. We've had a lot of uh, enthusiasm with some staff members and getting progress photos. Uh, my time has been dedicated elsewhere occasionally to actually sort through photos, so I've actually focused on doing that here. Uh, the rain has given me opportunity to sit at my desk and do that. Uh, just to, I'm going to do a real quick summary of where we were at. Um, I quickly forget, as many people probably do, just what this looked like about uh, two years ago. Uh, so these are just some of the photos from the promotional material we put together when we were looking for funding. You can see how bad the track was, the parking lot, uh, the gravel lot, the grass fields there. Um, and then this was the original master plan that we had when we first went out for the big asks. Um, as you recall, we had some land acquisition concerns. Uh, some of the configuration of the parking lot changed. But then these were just some of the renderings we had. I actually enjoyed going back to look at what we thought we were going to do versus what uh, we ended up getting into. And I, if you maybe saw some of these boards we put up around the football field, but we actually had a, a guy every Friday afternoon that would go out and take a picture when they were ripping up the football field from the exact same spot every, every Friday. Um, that's his excuse for leaving at noon every Friday. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was a win-win. So it <laughs> was not me. Uh, <laughs> uh, what you can see here is um, this was two, uh, two Mays ago, uh, the May where we had two days without rain. Uh, this was one of the days without rain where they ripped all the grass out in the top picture there. And then you can kind of see what we dealt with. Uh, they actually worked in the rain for the most part. We had created ourselves a fishbowl, uh, so they just used the track equipment and just made it worse, uh, hoping for some sunshine. You can see here on the bottom where they're starting to grade it out. Uh, then basically as we're going through the pictures here, um, these look a lot better on the big poster boards, uh, but you can see where they're uh, conditioning the soil, turning uh, Council Bluff's wonderful material into an actual usable material by adding some of the uh, fly ash out of the power plant, uh, putting in some trench material, moving around the rock. You can see we actually added a bajillion tons of rock in there. Uh, that, uh, that process actually, we hit the one window in the month of June where we could do it without causing problems. 
and then you can see the fabric going in here. We actually managed to get a lot of the fabric in. Uh, this was a nice hot August, which worked out fairly well to get it in. And that was uh, the night before the 11 inch rainfall that we had that flooded the entire site out. Uh, but it gave us some really nice clouds. So uh, that was that. And then as soon as we got the football field done, we did the grand opening for the football field. The following Monday, we moved in and started ripping up the soccer fields and proceeded to have a significant amount of rain. And uh, this was actually from an irrigation hose that uh, stayed on when it should have been on, uh, flooded out the site for us. But uh, one thing I'm always amazed by when I've gone through these pictures is how we have managed to, the contractor has managed to work in the small windows of good weather that we had while utilizing the site. Um, this, is, uh, this was actually in January, uh, 15 months ago or so. Uh, we actually, the ground is frozen, which was the only time we could work on it because we didn't sink into the ground. Uh, at the same time, we had a contractor as the homes were getting purchased and moved out, we could actually get in there and do some demolition. We had to do them one at a time. Uh, once again, we had a cooperative contractor who was willing to work with that. This is where the new entrance is. Uh, that was after the final home had come down and they were starting to level it out. Uh, this here is the locker room facility. This was about uh, 12 months ago. This was in late May, early, or late April, early May as they were putting it up, and you can actually see uh, they were using the fields, and all the sports complex was used throughout the entire process. Uh, you can see kind of just the progress is here. And then uh, this is just a few more. I get very excited about pictures like these. I, others don't as much. But uh, <laughs> this is the softball field going is. You can see here the contrast between the natural grass one on the left and the synthetic one on the right. Uh, similar process to what the football field is. Here, uh, the carpet's actually laying flat here. It's a, about a two inch tall carpet. They're just putting in the first few layers of sand there. That's where the stripes are you see going through there. Uh, then uh, this was moving into mid to late summer as we knew the football season was quickly coming up. Um, we continued to move forward with the paving. Uh, we were down there quite a bit. And likewise, we were trying to get the soccer fields graded out and utilized so we could get the grass down so they'd be ready to go in the spring because that wasn't an option not to have that ready in the spring. Uh, meanwhile, uh, now that we had the houses down, the city moved in with their project. They were a great partner on it and tackled Avenue J simultaneously. And you can actually see in the background, they are sodding the soccer field. This was late into the fall. I believe this was October, November. Uh, winter took a while to set in this past year, uh, which was, again, a very fortunate outcome. Uh, you can, this is uh, actually the city's contractor working on it here. And then this was yesterday, the one bout of sunshine. We managed to sneak in a few more extra photographs. And you can see, this is what you'll see when you go by on 16th Street. Uh, on the right there is Varnes. Uh, the new wall is going up on the uh, left side there. Uh, the back side is all bricked up. I'm not sure if they did that so that they could figure out how to do the curve before they did the part everyone can see. But it is coming along pretty well when they can have some sunshine. They are down there. Uh, if you drive through there, the moundings and such are coming in. The uh, soil is tough to work with right now, but they're making it work the best they can. These are the soccer fields. You can, uh, the brown is actually from the use of the fields so much. They, uh, Stacy's uh, staff does an amazing job keeping these things emerald green, considering how much heavy use they get. Uh, this is the uh, ticket booth area there. Uh, the sign package, we finally have all the final donors' names right and precisely as they wanted it, and we are out getting those to get the plaques on there for football season. And the, uh, this is the uh, other athletic, uh, the field event area. Uh, this grass, you know, between the javelins and the shot put takes a decent beating uh, for a fresh grass. It really performed pretty well. Uh, we actually had the contractor down there yesterday. He was... Uh, reseeding a lot of areas that just didn't quite bounce back the way he wanted. Uh, that's one of the risks you take doing reseeding in November. That is the end of it. We have plenty more pictures if anyone wanted to see them or whatever, but that's where we are at. Any questions? Anticipated final finish? Yes. I hope so. When? <laughs> <laughs> the same answer you get Someday. Someday. <laughs> We, uh, before football season, uh, we have June written in the contract. However, with the wet spring, the city's roadway project did not get done until right. about two months after their target date. Uh, they know they're used to working with school districts. They know what the real deadlines are. On the new front main entrance, yes. 
there's these open areas. Is that for the conference? On the team? vertical sections? Yeah. Those will be light boxes. Uh, LED light boxes don't have a nice glow to them when they're all said and done. Uh, we set it up so that when snow is being thrown off Highway 6, the, the DOT or the city's doing the snow removal, it still lights up. So I snuck down to the complex on Saturday for personal reasons to take prom pictures. But anyway, <laughs> there was not a drop of water at all anywhere. As much rain as we had last week. I mean, yeah, I have to amazing. commend Dayless Construction, the uh, paving contractor, hand poured the entire site. Um, that normally isn't a recipe for success with this type oh, of project, just, but they had to piecemeal it so much, and the bird baths down there it are It looked amazing, time. yeah. I had an opportunity to speak with one of the site workers, um, and he, you could just see the pride in his face beaming about him running around in the gator and trying to you know, take care of things on a Saturday and um, making sure that they're serviced, and he said it's just a really proud thing for him to take care of that. Um, the TJ baseball team was practicing on the football field. That's how nice it was. And they were hitting ground balls. And I mean, it, it was just nice to see the facilities getting used. Um, it's really awesome. We started using the football field last year with softball. We bought them the spider bases that'll work on any of the turf fields so yep. they can basically use that football they field were hitting anytime balls, for one corner, fly balls in mm -hmm. the other, running around. I mean, it was just, it was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those tur both turf fields have been doing fantastic mm -hmm. and have allowed the kids to use the fields in times that normally we wouldn't have been able to um, allow them to do it. I know they had a soccer tournament, and that's kind of why the <coughs> soccer fields are looking a little bit muddy, but I talked to Joe yesterday, who's our grounds foreman, and he's like, oh, yeah, we'll have that back up and looking fantastic, kind of like what a football field used to look like. So. We've held several track meets there. Um, that I've been to and just to walk around and hear people from the conference and it, mm -hmm. it, it's very, people are extremely complimentary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and give kudos to this guy. He's had to yes. keep them in shape Thank the whole time. <laughs> We also should notice that Barry Cleveland is here in the audience mm -hmm. and you might recall Barry and Vern Welch were our two yes. committee co-chairs. So isn't it nice you get to see this? Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Excellent. I have, I have one question. <laughs> the other day when I was at TJ, are we going to do anything with that fence where they used to guard the railroad tracks? Yes, that's part of that whole railroad. We're taking the That's all coming out. out. <laughs> about half of it right now. We're going to re-landscape that whole area and make it look like it belongs versus the railroad tracks. And we're not going to have a bike trail through there anymore? I or? think they've given up on, have you heard anything lately? I yeah, I mean, we okay, think that they're think that's good. up on that project. So we'll slowly but surely kind of work our way down. And well, this, the fences to me just looked unsightly now. It's just right. So right. we got that under control. Great. Was there, are we keeping one of the fences? I assume the one that's by the road? Or are they both going the on? football field fence, yeah. that'll continue to be there, but we're hoping to take the other fence out in due time. Um, we'll probably remove, it looks like half of the fence is coming down. Um, basically from the corner of where they're removing the rock all the way out to the street. We're looking at removing that, but again, until they get the all the rock removed and the detention ponds Is taken care of, we don't know how far they're gonna go with the need for the rock. So. Okay, and that's- I get that cleaned up, because it looks a little unsightly. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's our responsibility then, is between the, the fences we then? Maintain that now, we yeah. maintain that, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Tim Hamilton with the 2016-17 climate survey data.
Good evening, I'm here to present on the district climate, the annual report. You may remember um, we use three different surveys that we do. Uh, we do a student survey, which is the Gallup student poll, which is done every year in October. Grades five through 12, parent survey that we actually just finished up about a week and a half ago, so kudos to Diane and Marty Shudak and Jesse Stefel, even though she was home with a baby, I, she answered the phone a couple times when I called her for help, so kudos to them. And then we do the Human X survey for staff, which we reported on earlier this uh, school year in October. So the Gallup student poll measures four things, engagement, hope, entrepreneurial aspirations, career and financial literacy. Uh, the last two, this is just the second year, hope and engagement have been, um, for several years now we've measured. It's a 24 question survey. This year we had 3,334 uh, students complete it, which is down a little bit from 2015, but up from 2014. All the data is in your board packet for you to see, but you can see by looking at this, our engagement and hope um, increased just slightly, while the other two decreased slightly. And I think one of the things we're, we're going to be talking about in the future when I say suggestions, um, just the presentations that Dr. Vorthman and Jason have shared, um, this board meeting and the last, I think, will address the career and financial literacy and the entrepreneurial aspirations. The speech teacher would be very happy with me. I'm doing okay with that. Come a long way. Uh, <laughs> the parent survey is a, is a 10 question survey that we do with parents. We do it over the phone uh, or they have the option of doing it online. School, we do it through school messenger on the phone. Uh, schools also advertise it on their peach jar on Facebook and um, websites. This year the numbers uh, are really consistent just the numbers of, of parents who did the survey and the actual results. Uh, one thing that we're excited to see is we, we see a little jump in our Spanish-speaking population. Uh, with hiring, and I'm not contributing this to her, but with hiring a um, bilingual community liaison, I think it's really going to help because she is doing a wonderful job. Her name is Felicia Moreno. She's doing a wonderful job of engaging our families even in the short time she's been here. So, and she's also a parent, so she, that helps because she understands what, what we're doing in schools and um, has a couple of different kids at different levels. So I'm excited to see if this will continue to grow in the future. So the 10 questions, when I look, th when I look through these, four of, the, four of the questions, the percentage stayed the exact same. Four, the percentage went up by a percent or two and, and two they went down. Um, you can look through the questions yourselves. I know we're, we're running a, a little late, but one of the things that I, I'm excited about for the future is we have Strategic Plan 2.1 talks about parent engagement. And so we've put a lot of work into that this year as far as what we could do to help parent engagement. Um, not just parents coming to school, but getting them involved and in knowing, you know, through uh, power school, it's really easy for parents to be able to check on their students' grades and everything um, that they're doing in class, but really just we want to, the biggest message we got when we did a parent forum earlier this year was just the communication and how are schools communicating with their parents. Uh, we have many different ways in which we do. I think the question I have as a parent too is, so with each classroom I have my child in, how, how is that teacher communicating? So. Just working on some communicating with um, parents and then using some of the areas where we know parents already come to school for concerts and for sporting events. So if we can increase um, learning about curriculum and learning about what's going on in school when they're already there, I think will be beneficial. So that group, uh, that committee working on family engagement has done some good work that I'm looking forward to next year actually putting into to place. The Human X survey, as you know, uh, last year that you're looking at your top right hand box is really the, the, I think we call it the dream box, is that's where we want everybody to be. Decreased um, just a little bit from the, the previous year. Uh, when we look at Human X, the five highest ranking items that we had were, were really 
great to see because people are saying that they're looking for ways to improve. They're committed to the success of the school district. They're engaged at work. They feel pride in what they do and they want to contribute to the success of the schools. That's awesome. The areas where we have to work, where we're, we have created some goals, um, is you can see these five questions, but I fill in on things happening in Council Bluffs, provided the opportunity to spend quality time with my supervisor administrator, provided personal coaching from my supervisor, uh, has a genuine concern and interest about me as a person, and I've received meaningful recognition in the last 10 days. Each school had their own, um, has their own surveys from their staff, so we distribute that to them. So they're able to create goals based upon their own school. These are the district scoring items. So I talked a little bit about suggestions for 2017, and I know I went through this um, quickly. Uh, I would welcome any questions that you have. So for, not a question particularly, but a comment. With our teacher leadership program, why aren't we seeing more results in those five that you just shared? I mean, if you're getting coached by a teacher, a fellow teacher, I mean, don't they see that as positive? I mean, I, those statistics kind of bothered me. Um, yeah. I think each, like I said, each school in each district, we are doing things to, and they change a little bit from year to year, um, but we're putting things into place and we're putting, we have the goals to get better. I, uh, I don't know that I can directly answer why a, a staff member may feel that they aren't getting enough coaching. Well, maybe they think it has to come from their principal or administrator. That could be. Rather than a colleague. Could very well be. That's really been one of, that's been one of the conversations that not only have we had, but HumanX has had with us, is that we have to get to the point that <coughs> members of our team understand that if Scott gives some sort of feedback to Troy, that's just as important right. as if the boss gave feedback to Troy. So um, we keep working on that. I it's think those they're always going to be the five lowest. No sure. Matter what. And our five lowest seem to be there. They kind of change as to which is lower and which is higher, but. It's, it's generally in, I don't get enough feedback, um, they don't really care about me, et cetera. And you know we've been trying for quite a few years. So. And it, it looks like the scores, I mean, the score was like 3.45 was the lowest score, is that's on, that's on a scale from one to five. Correct. So it's still pretty high, it just happens to be something has to be at the bottom and this is what it is and that's what we work on. Agreed. It's interesting too um, when you go to schools if as you walk around a school and I see signs because j just the point that was brought up it doesn't always have to be from your supervisor al although it's great I, I know um, if Dr. Bruckner ever said anything nice about me it would make me feel good um, <laughs> but there's signs up there's signs up that even at schools that said have you given meaningful recognition because we have so many uh, supports in our buildings and, and teachers who see good work who are, who are seeing their coworkers every day so it really is important that it doesn't always uh, have to come from that supervisor so I think that's a great point. But that's not what the question asks. The question asks if their boss has given them recognition or feedback. So I think we have to look at this at a little bit different angle. Who are they seen as their boss? Um, you know, I mean, it, it, it's not boss, yeah, you're right. Like I have received meaningful recognition in the last 10 days. You talked about it. So who are they, I, mean, I am provided personal coaching from my supervisor administrator. So that, I, maybe they don't see teacher leaders as a supervisor or administrator. Right. And they aren't. Mm -hmm. right. Right. right, so I and think. And is it kind of inappropriate for our it would. Or? And I've been sitting here for four years looking at these five and they seem to be the same five <coughs> that I've looked at for the last four years. So. I'm, I'm curious what we're doing to get more definition of what these questions are asking and why they're scored at three. How can we get to a four? What do we need to be doing? What can we ask? What more details do we need to get these scores up? Because it's the same five questions that are the lowest. So what are we doing? I can guarantee you that we are doing things, but there are really right. there are only this many hours in a school day 
we talk about it. I know that the principals meetings spend a majority of their time talking about how principals coach teachers. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the teachers saying that they want to be more, to feel like they're being coached? Are we getting feedback from them about that? Well, obviously these, the surveys aren't, we, we don't, they're anonymous. So, right. Um, but how do we get that information so we know what they want? Because I don't feel like we're meeting what they want if they're the same five things that we look at for four years. These conversations happen every year in the building, and we are not in the building to do that um, purposefully because it's supposed to be kind of like we in the mm -hmm. school are trying to figure out how we work on this. And in each of our schools, they set different goals and they work on different goals. So. Um, I understand what you're saying. I like Susan's point, the fact that these are all way above the mean. Human X would tell you that all of our scores are above what the mean is, and they're gonna be five at the bottom no matter what. I wish I wish there were none at the bottom, mm -hmm. but um, I, I don't I'm just curious what their ideas are, and if they're afraid to share them in an open forum, or if there's another way to share ideas that are anonymous, mm -hmm. just like their survey. I know each, I know with, with the building, we created, um, and I wasn't part of it, so, but there, w there was kind of the template created that Dr. Bruckner used with us as far as with the administrators, mm -hmm. was looking at the, the, at the district um, to really work on a team, but you're right, uh, it brings up an interesting point to know if, if teachers who may be scoring this low are, uh, or staff members, are sharing that in their, um, meetings when they're talking about and creating their goals within their own building. I'd be surprised if they are because I think they need an outlet to explain what they're looking for and what they want anonymously so that those ideas can be looked at. I don't know. So is there a way for the board to say, hey, we've seen this and we, we have concerns because it's always our goal to be a best place to work. And having seen this, we would love to have feedback on this to see if it generated anything, if it came I'm sure that's similar to what is being done on the school level, but. You, those of you who came to our holiday gathering um, this year, walked in on the administrator's conversation about this, because we were, we were discussing yeah. exactly this. Um, I, I want to do whatever you're asking to do, but there's part of me that thinks if you ask people what the bottom five are, there are always gonna be the bottom five. And the lowest number was 3.4. So if this number. message, which by the way, this was taken in October, yeah. we're just reminding you about it. If the message that goes out <coughs> says, oh my gosh, this is a problem, this isn't a problem. Now, we can always get better, but if your lowest is way above 50%, 3.45, I'm, I'm worried about the message that you're sending. Well, well we saw this, when did we see this before? In November. November. So, or January. I mean, maybe it's just the fact that we're seeing it again and we're going, this hasn't moved, you know. <laughs> you know, and I guess, you know, and I, I feel worse. Honestly, I feel that given the fact that uh, we just went went through, we went through in the legislature, that this number could be, I hope people know we care about them, but I almost feel it could be a little more negative because I know there's still people who have residual angst and pain over what happened. You know, so next year you could come back and you could get a lesser number and have things outside of your control. You know. Well, since I referenced the teacher leadership program, maybe that's a way to deal with this. Have we actually asked our staff what they think of that program? Have we had it three years? Yes, we do. We have to by state requirements. We do every single year. We have a report about that every year and we give it to the state. We do our own and the state does one. Have, have we had that? Mm -hmm. um, we did at one point. Um, it would just be interesting to compare that analysis or report to this, to me. But maybe we're wasting too much time on this. I'm sorry. Well, good question. I don't know. It's I'm trying to be really positive, folks. But we just gave every single staff member six coupons that included all sorts of things for free, and there were three people in the district that told me thank you, three. So there's a little part of me that thinks we can spend a lot of time on this, but 
these are not bad details. These are not bad numbers, and um, we also can't spend all of our time on that. Uh, Corey and his team is is uh, leading the effort, and they went to a recent conference from the um, gentleman who spoke, Bob Chapman, last year about everybody matters. I think we really try that. You started that goal with us, but um, human nature would not make me think that we're going to get all of these to five. Not necessarily that we shouldn't try, but I'm I'm worried that the tenor here is not what deserves to be the tenor based on the scores. And I guess I would also think that this being a point in time thing, if you had a bad week, bad interaction, you come and you take this. I mean, I, that's what's hard to think about a one-time scoring of a, no, what the we climate at that date. What we need to do is have somebody besides us talk to you about it. <coughs> Pay the extra 1000 or $2,000 to HumanX to do it, and they will come in and tell you that these scores They'll are remarkably yeah. high. And if they're saying it to you, then maybe that would make <laughs> you convinced. And you remember those instead discussions. Instead of us <laughs> saying it to you. I'm not, that's what he said. I'm not discounting any of the positive scores. I think they're great. I just... We push our teachers to, to make sure that our kids are being pushed and 100% graduation rate, and we have all of these extreme measures for that. And I just, I want to know what else can be done for our teachers when they answer these five questions. I, I want to know what else they want. Tell me what you want so that you feel like you're being coached or that you've had meaningful recognition. What does meaningful recognition mean to you? Tell me what that means. More definition. Well, I guess my thought would be that I think many of these are things we're doing now as best practices. Yeah. yeah. Right? Uh, meaningful recognition might be a tough one because what does that mean? That's personal. That's our lowest one. Um, so. But I mean, to me, that next one, that genuine concern for me, I mean, like that goes back to the same personal relationship in a building. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I guess this may not be a real solvable thing. Um, but it is a good score. But I remember when, they, when the folks came and they were talking about twos when we started, we had some 50, 60, 70 points below this, it seemed like. Um, so I feel like we had a discussion in November. I, I will introduce, are, are we moving on? Sure. Okay, I will introduce Sandy Day to talk about 21st century. Um, it's kind of been a joke all week with Sandy saying her time has started at 10 minutes and it's down to, uh, hmm. it's about down to 30 seconds. So if you know <laughs> Sandy, which you all do, it won't be 30 seconds, but she is, um, we speak frequently of her and her spot on the bus and s she is in the exact right spot on the bus and has done amazing things in her short time here. So Sandy's going to do a quick presentation. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Good morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello again. I just whispered that in my ear. Oh. Yeah. That's all it takes right there, Tim. <laughs> Do that a thousand more times. Good tomorrow. example. <laughs> I thought I would just throw this slide in there. I know that when I did the written report for you, um, there was a lot more detail in here, but I did just want to remind you that um, 21st Century Grant Award Funds are part of the ESSA Act. They are a title program. I think of them, this Title IV Part B, I think of it a lot about sort of the exact opposite of Title I, which typically is money spent during the day this is money spent after school hours, but it targets the same students. So students who participate in free and reduced lunch, and then students who may need some assistance academically with math and reading. Those are the two statutory pieces. 
Uh, any school or LEA that has a free reduced lunch rate above 40 or, uh, or higher may apply. And awards in this state cap out at $300,000. I mentioned in the uh, report that, you know, this uh, grant is given across the country. Each state amount of money is allocated differently, basically based on the numbers we just talked about. But across the state, we get um, $1.6 million uh, as a state. And I think it's really kind of interesting to see where Council Bluffs has come in three short years, uh, receiving just $300,000 three years ago to starting next year, we'll have about $1.1 million. So that's pretty amazing growth. So you get full funding for the first three years. Once you follow, um, you, you know, your site visitations and on the third year, there's a real serious and deep visitation from Vic Jarris, our state consultant. He was here this uh, spring and did a great, um, did a great job because he liked our, what we're doing here. He did a, a great job of interviewing staff, students, and our community partners, as well as families. Um, he observed everything we were doing and then he scored us on a rubric and uh, it has given us uh, permission for 75% funding for the next two years. And that number's up there. And then after five years, districts can reapply uh, for these <coughs> funds. And I asked Vic about this my very first year here because I was a little worried in my previous life that districts can reapply statement had been connected to some other federal money I had been awarded through the Magnet School Assistance Program grant, mouthful. Anyway, that was really very iffy in, in that world. But Vic's statement to me was, look, Sandy, we're looking for districts or other LEAs who can make a program that really works for kids, and we want to refund those programs year after year. I also did want to po point out that the focus is whole child development, so everything from physical health to mental health to academic growth, um, and you'll see how CBCSD has decided to kind of take that whole statement of whole child development and model it a little bit, um, little bit differently. So I just wanted to remind you, I know you know this, but these are your current school awards uh, and the years that they were started and their, their three-year guarantee. And again, at, each, at the end of each of those three years, they could get two more years of funding. And so far, like I indicated, Wilson and Kern are going to get two more years of 75% funding. This is our programming model from that whole child. Um, it's actually in state sta in federal statute, the whole child statement. If you have a better picture of this near your desk, it's in color. Isn't that nice? Um, but this slide is kind of cool because, and so is your card, because it reminds us all of our goals. And when you write a proposal to the state, you have to identify how many students you're going to target to serve, even though you can serve all the students in the school. But in, in the uh, middle school grant, we were looking to uh, serve 200 students per uh, school. And we're talking about um, uh, this, this phrase of uh, regular attendee. If you ever have a minute, if you can go to the Wallace Foundation, it's on that sheet and it's on this slide. It has got some great research about out of school programming and what works. And there's a tipping point at day 30 for any student who participates in an out of school program. What happens is you tend to see their attendance in school get better, their behavior in school get better, the social emotional development improves, uh, and, and if you do it right, their academics come right along with it. Maybe not one to one, but very closely uh, tied to that. You can see in our elementary uh, cohort at uh, Franklin, Longfellow, and Rue, we had based, and that was based on their enrollment, a little bit different goals there. But at both high schools, our goals are sitting at 160 students per school. And this is out of school programming during the school year as well as summer school. So we're saying that at AL and at TJ, in future years, we're going to get about halfway there this year. Um, we are going to make sure that we can serve at least 160 students for 30 days or more. Now, I know in your report, I didn't put this slide back up, or this graph back up here, but I am just so, so very proud of this. I can't help it. This is the coolest thing. On the second page of your report, even though those are the numbers we were targeting, which is a fairly small number, if you take a look at how many students we've actually served by these three cohorts, it is remarkable. 
We have served over 3,000 students. That's like a third of our population out of that bucket of money with 21st century. Uh, so at any rate, and it talks a little bit about our goals there and the number we need to get to participation, the participation we're looking for. And remember, this particular fiscal year is going to go through the end of June, and then starting July 1, we start over with our counts for attendance uh, for students. Well, I wanted to just share a couple of things, and this, of course, was in your report, but I just wanted to share a couple of things regarding our annual evaluation. So our annual evaluations are a year behind, just so that you know. So this is the 15-16 annual evaluation. It was completed Feb uh, February, November 30th, and then sent up to the federal office for a statewide report. Um, and these were things that were uh, um, in your um, in your uh, regular report, and talking about the fact that we did have attendees, regular attendees have better attendance than non-attendees. We had fewer discipline incidents w than non-attendees. And um, our regular attendees, at attendees achieved at the same rate as non-attendees in math and reading. And in my opinion, that's kind of a win-win because remember, we're targeting students who have an academic need in math and reading. And this was one thing I forgot to put in your uh, larger packet. But uh, the question about parent surveys, I, th I find this remarkable, 98% at middle school and 100% of our elementary parents that were surveyed and responded said that these clubs have been a very positive, uh, had a very positive impact on their students. Yay, we have a new award. I might have mentioned this, I think I did, I couldn't help it. Uh, so Mr. Hamilton and I went out about mid-April uh, and let our two new schools know, uh, Carter Lake and Roosevelt, that they were receiving a 21st Century Grant Award starting July 1. Uh, we asked for $300,000. They had to cut us back a little bit. They were a little worried about future funding uh, at the state level, so we only received uh, the $250,000 for three years. Reminder of what this money can be used for. Obviously, it will pay our teachers or youth development workers or um, community partners that may charge us. Most of them don't charge us very much, if, if at all. Uh, we can take students places, we can buy supplies, we can provide professional development as long as it aligns with the goals of 21st century and it's something that the principal wants. And then we also have to do our program evaluation. I did talk really at, at, in detail on the summer program, but if you don't mind, I'd just like to take one more minute and say what a remarkable thing I think this is. That Council Bluff Schools has decided to take their existing programs at all levels and take this, this program and marry them together to really serve more students over a longer period of time in the summer. Um, and that's remarkable. We're going to be serving about 380 students at the zoo is our goal, and about 580 students in the elementary sites uh, combined. Uh, high school, the numbers are, we don't really have a required number. Some of that depends on how many students need uh, credit recovery and then how many other students uh, sign up for those other activities that we've already talked about. Um, I also want to say that there's no way you can like run school, regular school and regular after school, and then develop this thing without an incredible team of people. And one of those people is sitting right over there, and her name is Toby Reese. I don't know how we would be where we are, seriously, <laughs> without her team helping us interview all of the teachers we need for all of these things over the summer and get all the paperwork the way it needs to be and keeping us um, doing things right, me included, because sometimes I get the cart ahead of the horse and she reminds me. But at any rate, we couldn't be where we are without her. And I appreciate that. We all appreciate that. Um, questions? Any questions from the board? Uh, again, I don't have a question, but I just did a little math. Okay. From your figures about the monetary award. Mm -hmm. I figured if we have 2% of the student population in the state of Iowa, we're getting 7%, 7 of the funding available. That's kudos to you and your team. Thank you. It's also kudos to the vision of this woman who three years ago said, hey, you know what, I think we really need to take a look at this. And, and going forward, I guess I would say there, is, there are two more elementaries that could qualify for this money, and that would be Bloomer and Edison for next year. 
hoping that we have this again as a daily you know, fight. Uh, but if this is offered again, I would suggest that we try to write one more grant to include those students in those schools because they could certainly benefit from these programs as well. Thank you for that. I'm glad you do math so well. I was a social studies teacher, so I rely heavily on a calculator and spreadsheets. Sandy, do you have um, some sort of an announcement that we should make tonight? I, oh, I don't know. It, well, okay, yes. We had a phone call from this Vic Jaris man that we talked about. He's our state consultant. Sorry. Um, but there is a sub-department uh, of the de uh, Department of Education that has created these amazing online resources called, in, in a bucket, an electronic bucket called You for Youth, Y-O-U-F-O-R, Youth, Youth. Uh, and it, they're amazing online um, resources for STEM curriculum, oh, you name it. There's even PD up there. They're unveiling a new program we can use after school, it's only for 21st century, we can use after school for program evaluation. And since I got here, I've been saying, you know, my old tools and my old bucket just don't work for what I'm doing. And we don't really have a good tool. So they're going to unveil some, some tools for us on uh, June 22nd. And Vic called us, called us up and said, hey, we're under a travel ban. Thank you, President. Anyway, and we are not allowed to go at the state level. So we can look around the state and we can <laughs> ask someone to go uh, from the state and represent the state of Iowa. And he asked us if we would like to send their representative, which is your representative to this to um, DC, to receive these tools and get the training on it. And I feel like that is such an honor. He's got 102 sites. He's got a lot of pro, uh, pro project or program directors he could choose from and a lot of different school districts he could have looked at. So I think you should feel really proud that we've been selected, all expenses paid, uh, to go and learn this training and be able to bring it back for the state. So that's really exciting. That's very awesome. And, and congratulations to you. This is visionary. I'm just the worker bee. No. I'm the worker bee. Dr. Worker bee. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Sandy. <sighs> All right, so now we come to our resolutions. And first we have uh, our elementary playground. So uh, is there a motion for the uh, plan specification contract? I'll move approval of the plan specifications in form of contract for bid 17-017 Rue Elementary Eastside Playground as presented. Thank you, Chris. Is there a second? Second. second. Any discussion? Again, not discussion, but I assume we have given a shout out to the PTO there at that school for raising the 15,000. I mean, that's really commendable mm -hmm. to help offset the cost of this. I would assume so. Excellent, Dean. Mr. LaFerla? Yes. Ms. Riley? Yes. Mr. Grove? Yes. Mr. Kazire? Yes. Dr. Augress? Yes. Mr. Hansen? Yes. Mr. Arthur? Yes. And motion is carried. Now we have a approval of the Special Education 28E Consortium Agreement uh, with Apex, Corgan, and Glenwood. Is there a motion? Sure, I'll move that. I move that Council Plus Community School District join the Southwest Iowa APEC Consortium via 2080 agreement and direct the board president to sign the consortium agreement for the 1718 school year as presented. Thank you, Bill. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Chris. Any discussion? Seeing none, Dean. Mr. Grove? Yes. Mr. LaFerla? Yes. Mr. Kazire? Yes. Dr. Augress? Yes. Ms. Riley? Yes. Mr. Hansen? Yes. Mr. Arthur? Yes. And the motion is carried. Uh, now we have ooh, approval of our tentative list of 2017 <laughs> graduates. Does anybody <laughs> have a motion? I, Dr. I move to approve the tentative list of 2017 graduates of Abraham Lincoln and Thomas Jefferson High Schools as presented. Is there a second? Second. 
Is there any discussion or shouts of joy? <laughs> the board? Okay. Uh, Dean, go ahead. Dr. Augress? Yes. Ms. Riley? Yes. Mr. Grove? Yes. Mr. LaFerla? Yes. Mr. Kazire? Yes. Mr. Hansen? Yes. Mr. Arthur? Yes. And that list is approved. Uh, good job. <laughs> now we have a pool of revised job descriptions uh, for network system specialists. Is there a motion? I would move to approve the revision to the network system specialist job description as presented. Thank you, Bill. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? Further information needed? A comment. Comment. Is that a typo under education and or experience? Or you need a double A degree in computer science or related field required? Thank you. Could you hold these it questions? says AA. <laughs> The BA program. Associate of Arts. Associate of Arts. Okay. okay. That Here's was my question. I didn't degree. know if that was no. a meant something or if that was an actual no, typo. That's an actual typo. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Grove? Yes. Ms. Riley? Yes. Mr. LaFerla? Yes. Mr. Kazire? Yes. Dr. Augress? Yes. Mr. Hansen? Yes. Mr. Arthur? Yes. And the job description is approved. Uh, now we have approval of uh, our bid 17-016, uh, Request for Furniture and Installation Services. Is there a motion? I move to award bid number 17-016, Request for Furniture and Installation Services to Office Interiors and Design of Omaha, Nebraska. Thank you, Joe. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion or questions? I did like those cool little puzzle chairs. I didn't see those on the bid. <laughs> okay. Dr. Augress? Yes. Mr. LaFerla? Yes. Mr. Grove? Yes. Mr. Kazire? Yes. Ms. Riley? Yes. Mr. Hansen? Yes. Mr. Arthur? Yes. And the bid is awarded. So now we have approval of RFP 17 012 bids. Is there a motion? I move to award the low bid for Acer C740 Chromebooks and Acer N11 Chromebooks to CDW-G in the amount of $717,350. Need separate motions here? Two separate motions? I think so, yeah. 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 Okay, is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Mr. LaFerla? Yes. Ms. Riley? Yes. Mr. Grove? Yes. Mr. Kazire? Yes. Dr. Augress? Yes. Mr. Hansen? Yes. Mr. Arthur? Yes. The motion is carried. And now we would have uh, approval or a motion for the second bid? I move to approve the low bid for Acer R13 Chromebooks to Hypertech in the amount of $115,800. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Ms. Riley? Yes. Mr. Hansen? Yes. Mr. Grove? Yes. Mr. LaFerla? Yes. Mr. Gazire? Yes. Dr. Augress? Yes. Mr. Arthur? Yes. And the motion is carried. Um, now we have uh, policy review and approval. Uh, final reading of policies and administrative regulations. Does anyone want to read those? <laughs> Make that motion. We have to read them, don't we? I move to approve the second reading of policies 510, 601, 606, 617, 628, 633, 634, 712, and 801, and the first and only required reading of administrative regulations 422.1, 520, 527.1, 527.2, 527.3, 527.4, 527.5, 527.6, 603.3, 603.4, and 617.1 as presented. Very nice. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any discussion on that big list? Any questions? Ms. Pearson. Are you sure? Yeah. Bear with me. Uh, 527.5, which is the nutrition standards for school meals couple of things. One, there's three pages, one of three. <laughs> but a lot of it, a lot of it's rewritten, so 
I figured that was it. These are the guidelines that have been, that was in 2012. Is that right? That was brought down. There's a change in that. Just changing it now. Okay, so this is just an update. Okay. I noticed something, and <clears throat> I think it's that policy as well that I had a question about. It said that we're required to provide free water uh, during meal times. Mm -hmm. And then lower in the policy, I can't find it now. Okay. It said that we may charge for water. I was saying that um, you may sell up to eight ounce portions um, of no tap portion water. size limit for plain water. Hospitals may sell plain water. Okay. Does that mean inside um, inside machines or? Could be inside Questions? machines. It could Probably. be in the concession area, et cetera. Yeah. Gotcha. But Maybe versus lunch. lunch. You know, okay. Have it. Any other uh, policy discussion? Mr. Mr. LaFerla? Yes. Dr. Augress? Yes. Mr. Grove? Yes. Mr. Kazire? Yes. Ms. Riley? Yes. Mr. Hansen? Yes. Mr. Arthur? Yes. And the uh, final reading and first reading and final reading of some of the uh, policies has approved. Now we have final reading of Administrative Regulation 701.1 .1, Purchase Bidding. Is there a motion? I move to approve changes to Administrative Regulation 701.1 .1, Purchase Bidding as presented. Is there a second? I'll second it. <coughs> Excellent. Um, any discussion? I seem to recall at the same meeting that the proposed tax increase was mentioned to us, even though we didn't vote on it at that meeting. It was also brought up that they didn't want us to approve the second reading of this per particular policy because they wanted to raise their spending limits as well. <coughs> and I just find it a bit troubling that number one, they, they said we're going to request more money from the taxpayers and we're going to request you to raise our spending limits at the same time. Okay. As one of the bay I think you're referring to, this is not the second reading of an administrative regulation. This, there was only one reading of administrative regulations, and we said at the time <coughs> that when we were working with our attorney, the attorney recommended that our um, limits were too low for efficiency. That was why we brought it. We had... Um, made up our mind that we would bring it back to you whenever we brought, um, we're gonna fix this by the next meeting, right? Whoever does that. Um, when, we, when we brought back some other administrative regulations, we would bring it, so that's, that's the reason that we brought this tonight. Certainly we'll listen to any suggestions you have for changes. And, and the figures that are being suggested by this, are much more in line with what the state. Um, our um, figures in the past have been extremely low. Um, and so if we're going to follow model policies, they should resemble what, what the state <coughs> represents as what a model policy should look like. So these are more in line with, these values are much more in line with what, what the state regards as a model policy. Yeah, I think some of this, I assume, was due to cost of districts that have to do bids for items that were mm -hmm. between five and 25,000 right. instead of just having someone they've worked with and have experience with and they just make a purchase. Would that be correct? Or? Yes. We, we also checked with our other UEN districts <coughs> and they were right in line with this. So I assure you, Scott, there's no nefarious intent in terms of raising limits to spend money. Any other discussion on this matter? All right, Dean, go ahead and call the roll. Uh, Dr. Augress? Yes. 
Mr. Grove? Yes. Mr. LaFerla? Yes. Mr. Gazire? Yes. Ms. Riley? Yes. Mr. Hansen? No. Mr. Arthur? Yes. And the uh, administrative regulation has passed. Now we have approval of a consent agenda, which includes uh, approval of contracts for placement of student teachers, approval of agreement for exchange of services between the Council of Community School District and Green Hills AEA for the next uh, school year, personal action, claims, and accounts. Is there a motion? Move approval of our consent agenda. Excellent. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? Dean, go ahead and call the roll. Mr. Gazire? Yes. Ms. Riley? Yes. Mr. Grove? Yes. Mr. LaFerla? Yes. Dr. Augress? Yes. Mr. Hansen? Yes. Mr. Arthur? Yes. The consent agenda is approved. Um, now we need to move into closed session. Will someone please make a motion? <laughs> 